and our next guest is one of the most exciting businessmen whose work is helping to make that necessity a reality. He's a brilliant entrepreneur. When he arrived in America at the age of just 22, he spoke very little English and had only a few thousand dollars in his pocket. In fact, I believe he even milked cows at one point to pay his way through college. Today, he is the founder of the multi-billion dollar yogurt enterprise, Chobani. Yeah, that alone. And he's not sure he'll call, he'd call himself a social entrepreneur, but we'll talk about that when he comes out here. But he does say that business is still the most effective way to change the world. And his mission with Chobani is to inspire a new way of business, a new way of work, and a new way of innovation. Skull World Forum, please welcome Hamdi from Chobani. So, Hamdi, um, you studied political science at Ankara University, and I think that means I can throw you right in the deep end with a really big question, which is how does capitalism need to change? I quickly understood that you couldn't change it with politics, you could change it with yogurt. So, <laughs> and I left that and then and started making yogurt. And um, I, just let me tell you this this is, I've heard about this, but I've, I've never thought it was gonna be this, and Jeff, thank you. This is, um, this is amazing, the energy here, um, and, and I, I've been to very energy places, but this is what we look for today. This is what, what we need, this is what we are, um, like, a, like a you know, thirsty person in the desert, this is the human spirit that we need, and I'm so glad to be here, so thank you very much for You're so welcome. Me. Look, I, you introduced me as a, as a businessman. I, hate, I hated CEOs and I hated rich growing up. I'm a, a, a son of a, uh, you know, a, a, a shepherd, a, a nomad. I grew up up in the mountains. You know, beautiful life growing up in the mountains and making cheese and yogurt and coming back to our village growing up as a Kurdish. Uh, and we would see the rich and their behavior and the businesses, large companies, and you know, it didn't align what my mother was teaching, so I never thought I would end up becoming this. I never thought I would get involved with business. I would, I would always think of myself to be, you know, other side. And when I was building my, my work, the only thing that I wanted to do is I, want, I don't want to be the one who I grow up hating. So how, how do I do that? So every day there's a quality check that you do, and you say, okay, have I become that one yet? You know? <laughs> and, and, and I, I, haven't, I haven't publicly said this many times, except my colleagues that I worked with in the plant last time we did the Chobani shares, and I'll, I'll say it here, uh, it's, it's very private, because I'm really inspired. I put my mom's, you know, in, in Kurdish tradition, you put some headscarves in, your, in their head, and she had uh, a, a, a green one that, the day that she passed away, I always hold on to it, and Louis knows. On my Chobani hat, I've always put that under for years. Um, and for as much as you know, I remember when I started Chobani. The reason I did that is if I get drunk, if I, if I lose the way it is, and if there's nobody can correct me, there's only one person could correct me, that would be my mom. So if I carry that in here, <laughs> You know, I, I know I could do wrong, but she would teach me otherwise. I mean, we need, we need powerful people, not only relatives, but powerful people in our life to keep us right. Because in the end, those ideas are right. What Vinny said, it was 100% right. But when you are in the world of business, entrepreneurship, and social entrepreneurship, whatever it is, you get engaged with money. And then you get engaged with power, you get engaged with fame, you get engaged with a lot of stuff. And it's very easy to lose the side of it, and I have then you, you are in search of someone to come to tell you, okay, you gotta come to the right place. And then the business is fun. And you ask me outside, why you don't call yourself a social entrepreneur? And I met Bill this morning, uh, who are the founder of the idea, and there are hundreds of them. Of course, I would be honored to be called social entrepreneurship. But what we have to do, and I'm, I'm just gonna stop there, 
is it's okay to be angry. I love things, but I am also I hate things too. <laughs> but but also we need to channel that into a right place. And and I didn't want Chobani organization to become like a idea of a church or an NGO or anything like that. I want it to be a competitive innovator and, and angry about the competitor that doing wrong, which is for us is the big food and you know the, the type of a CEO or a president or whatever they call themselves. And, and being angry about it and to channel that to a certain way, and you win in the marketplace. The good people has to win. The good people has so to win. He thinks we're so much nicer. You think so much nicer? We're angry, right, guys? Yeah. So then I'm a social entrepreneur. Too. Okay. All right. <laughs> You're in. Let's talk about um, your response to the refugee crisis. It's something which you've been involved in both as a, as a philanthropist and as a businessman. And I think that's really interesting. We heard Winnie saying, you know, charity cannot be the only response to these problems. And I feel like you've come at that in both ways. Because you donated $2 million to UNHCR, and you've also made a pledge to give away more of your wealth to the issue. But you've also really tried to embed a response to that into your business itself. I think that currently 400 of your employees, one-fifth of your employees, are refugees. Do you want to just speak to how you got involved and what your philosophy is? Sure. Um, you know, starting at Chobani, I started in upstate New York, a little town, and, and a factory was closed after 90 years. And, and, and the way I started is five factory workers and myself, and, and a, a little anecdote there is the first board meeting I had was for old craft workers and myself, and in the first board meeting, we decided that we we're going to paint the wall outside. And it hasn't been painted for 25 years, right? So, <laughs> and the guy, one of them said, Hamdi, that's fine, we'll do that, but tell me you have more ideas than that. <laughs> and I, I, honest to God, I, had not, I did not have any other idea. <laughs> and these guys are going to bet on me to not to move or not to look for any other jobs. They just lost the job. So, and, and I was the only Turkish guy, up to, Kurdish, Turkish, whatever, and in that town, they had not seen a guy like me before. And time passes. We start the business. It's moving. We're adding people. And I hired all the people that left Kraft at that time. They lost the job. They came back. That was 55, and then we became 100, and then we became the 200, and then we expanded our you know, geography. And I lived in Utica, um, which was about 30 miles north of that little town, and I heard that there are refugees are settled in this town, that they were having a very tough time finding a job. And we were expanding, and you know, I hired everyone in that area, and I'm looking more, and I, I went to the refugee center, and, and, and it was true, it was one of the settlement places. And I said, what's the problem? They said, well, a couple. One is, you know, they're different. They, 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 people are not used to it yet. Second is language. You know, they don't speak English well. And then another one is transportation. So they don't have driver license to be able to drive. And I said, look, well, there were a few, some others. I said, look, well, we can hire translators. And, and we can put buses. And, and we can train them. And we did. And those simple solutions. Um, we start hiring them. They come, and I mean, amazing. Uh, so today in South Edmonton, and, and I did the same thing in Idaho, in, in Twin Falls. Uh, proudly, we have 19 different nationalities in, in our company uh, that comes from different different parts of the world as refugee. And um, <laughs> one one beautiful thing is we created this beautiful community in these plants. And, and people built their life making yogurt, you know? And, and the friendship and this beautiful relationship that among the locals and the people from, you know, someone from Myanmar, someone from Somalia, someone from Syria, uh, and watching this whole thing to happen in front of your eye. And this is not something I've done last year or year before. It's been in it forever. And when the Syrian crisis went into the, up into the scale, uh, I saw this picture. Uh, I think it was in New York Times, uh, that this Yezidi woman, were, hands were up in the air, 
And, and I know the face. I am from the region. I, 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 I know what I know the volcano is going, the burning is going in her heart. And, and she, you can tell there are many people are following and she's going towards the mountains when, the, you know, when they get attacked and they lost everything. That was a calling for me. And then I got personally involved. Um, I created a foundation called Tent and I did the pledge that Jeff did and maybe others did. And, and it became my, my reason of doing what I'm doing. Um, uh, and I've learned a lot since then. I, I was conscious about the crisis of refugee, but I had no idea there were 65 million people. I had no idea the average refugee lives in the camp is 17 years. I had no idea that every year UNHCR and some other organizations runs out of food and runs out of money to, to provide food and you know, uh, shelter, the basic, basic needs. I had no idea that you know, people who live in those conditions are hopeless and they have lack of education and you know, women rights and, and unemployment. So all that stuff, and I saw hardworking, heroic working of the aid workers on the field, which I visited, but I also saw bureaucracy, I saw waste, I saw a lot of, a lot of uh, waste of time and money, and I said, we have to bring this entrepreneurship way into this. We have to come in and we have to bring the more business world and I reached out to other CEOs and colleagues, and, and today we have 70 amazing companies that you know, pledge their, either enter, enter, their ability, their money, or their you know, technology to come in and, and, and tackle this problem. And it's just everybody's really, problem. Really, you, you sort of let yeah. that go by. I really yeah. want to underline that. Sorry, yeah, because people are beginning to applaud. I think those that know the story, because you basically went to Davos and you said, you said that it was mind-blowing how little companies were doing to provide employment for refugees. And you urged other companies to join you, and you grew that you know, in cohort. And now, yes, you're at 70, and this includes some really big companies too. I mean, this yes. is a, this is a yeah. huge uh, yeah. achievement. So yeah. now you can applaud him. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, is, it is, when I look at it, I think one of the most urgent crises that humanity is facing is this problem. I mean, we have other problems. You know, Bono, Bono is a great example of how you start from somewhere and, 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 and look at, you know, where AIDS and corruption and, you know, other issues that he's dealing with. It's, it, it is the branding, it is the approach, it is the elevation of the issue above the politics area to, to the area of every single individual can understand. And I trust that every one of us are good people. We just have to find a way to connect that, that energy to, to the problem. And if we don't fix that, what will happen? Uh, safety is going to be a problem. Um, you know, we might make it to the Mars, but if, if we leave those people behind, this world cannot go any further. You know, humanity will not go further. And if you have a, a little girl who just passed through the ocean, lost his little brother and made it to a tent. And I'm, this is real things that are happening. And, and if we are watching that and celebrating that going to the Mars, and I, I, I don't know if that's the humanity that we are all looking for. And I know we are all aligned in that idea. We just have to work harder and we just have to work faster because this issue has no, no time to waste. And, and the world it is where we are going, how we are talking about the walls, you know, we just said, not the walls, the bridges, I truly believe every single person, one person, either voice or time or money or whatever that is, it adds up and it becomes something. Mm -hmm. And if it comes from the right direction, like direction that comes from here, it is so powerful that it can grow so fast that we can overcome all the problems. And I know it because I've done it. You know, I've started with five people and we elevated ourselves into this idea that we could create something else in five years We've done something that's never been done before. It's the human spirit that needs to be lifted up. And I, I truly believe that we can do that. We do. Can you speak a bit more about your relationship with um, your workers? Because to, to Winnie's point about challenging inequality, this sense of workers needing to have a stake, as she said, you know, in, the, in the work that they do, I know that's something that you've been thinking about and you've shared some equity already and I wonder if you could speak to that philosophy. Um, same thoughts of what Winnie talked about and you know, Winnie talked about is, you know, 
I started there and I watched how we built this wealth. And, and the factory worker who I started with is, okay, I paid twice more than everybody else did. I had 401k, I had health insurance, almost all of it paid, and I had bonuses and all that stuff. Still, I'm making a calculation. And I, I, when I made the calculation is, how, how are they gonna buy the house? How are they going to afford the gas? And how are they gonna get food for their children that is good? And, and, and then, and then the later, how are they going to retire? It just, the math just doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. And it would be unfair to watch that this most beautiful thing has been created from the, you know, the ashes of the others and not to see others to benefit from it as much as it is. And, and it clicked me in, in the beginning and I had this in a long time. You know what the challenge was? The law, believe it or not, the most difficult part, for, I'd worked for two years to not to be treated as a public company because I have 2,000 people and I want, I want to make everybody a partner, not to be treated as a public company and give my shares to my employees. And I had to spend millions to be able to do that. So it's, it's very, the system is not allowing you to be able to do that um, and needs to be changed completely. <laughs> and, and today, uh, you know, I have 2,000 partners, and, 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 and it, is, it is not a gift. It is the recognition of what's right. That's how I see it. There are definitely people here who are very interested in changing those kinds of systems. Uh, and in fact, the chaps that invented the B Corp as a mechanism uh, are amongst the Skoll Foundation's grantees. So they're probably here, so maybe that's something which a connection can be made to make uh, the model that you've discovered more widely available for other people. But I want, to, I want to just quickly go back to your childhood and teenage years. You kind of said it very quickly at the beginning that you grew up uh, in a, a family uh, who were working with a cheese-making business. You kind of went, you said it very quickly, but I just wanted to spend a kind of moment there. So sure. what were your teenage years like? Were, you, um, were your Saturday chores just totally out of control? <laughs> what, being born into a small family business in Eastern Turkey? Yeah, it's, it's nomadic life. It's up in the mountains, and there's not a day goes by that I don't go back for a moment, um, that I don't make that connection. Um, it could be, I don't know, a, a leaves coming from the tree or, and then it just, or a wind hits you in a different direction or somebody looks like somebody. You always have a connection to your past. And I always remember my past, that simple life, as my, my source of everything I do in the life. And, and that's the thing, the immigrants, immigrants as myself, and including refugees, when we come, we bring something with us to another place. And I think... Yeah, you brought mad yogurt skills. Hashtag, hashtag. mad yogurt skills. <laughs> Culture. <laughs> uh, you know, we do. Um, and by the Euphrates River, mountains of Munzur, and I don't exactly know exactly which day I was born. I know it's October because the, as nomad, we were coming down. And, and when, you, when you're coming back from the mountains, it's about end of September or, or you know, early, you know, October, mid-October. So, um, you know, here's, here's, I'll give you one example how, how it was. And I'm, I'm not saying we didn't have issues, people fought and all that stuff, but there was this sense of security that in the barn, if there was a fire, and if you lost all your sheep, and you, let's say you have 200 of them, and that's what you live on, and your family you support on, you know that the next morning, Everybody's going to pick one of their best sheep and bring it to you. And in the end, you're going to have 200 sheep. And nobody's going to burn their barn, but they know that's going to happen if that happens. And that's a social security. That's one that you know that if you're down, there's somebody, even, though, even the person that you fought a couple of years ago, you had an argument, that was the social pressure uh, and order that it will bring it to you. And you would live in the mountains under the tent, and the men were the shepherds, they would go up in the mountains, and there was women and kids, and you know that you were, you were secure under those stars with maybe one dog, uh, not because you had guns or anything else, because you knew that 
just this, in, this, in this order, in social order, you'll be safe. Uh, and that's, that's where I lived. And that's, that's a very that, human economy. Yeah, that's very human economy. And that's where we have to, that's where we have to come. And, and you know, the tagline is here, is how do we create that social trust in every individual, every child, and wherever in the world, that if I'm down, somebody's out there in the world is, cares about me and is gonna you know, you know, bring their head. And it exists. You just, you just have to multiply. And, and I think it has to change its form to become more, I don't wanna use the word aggressive, but maybe, maybe a little bit louder, a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more, because otherwise, this is not just being good or right, this is just being more profitable, this is just being uh, a better living, this is just being, you, know, you can add on to this, and then you say, hey, investor, you can make money on this too. You know, if, if you only care about this, you can care. And, and, and we do need scholars, we do need thinkers, we do need all leaders of you know, social elements. But God, we need businesses to step up. Because we have tried all the different uh, government models you know, we have. And I have believed in one of them in the past. I do believe in you know, free market. I really do. I really do that it, it's needed and I really do need I, I really do think that it moves the humanity forward. And if we fill that model with these people, you're in heaven. That's how I believe. That's I want to be in do. heaven with you, Hamdi. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> Make yogurt, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've run out of time, but before I let you go, in the same Oxfam shop, I had to pick something up <laughs> for you too. Uh, Jemima and I, and because we know that you're going to join Winnie and I as a great defender of uh, the rights of women and girls too, Absolutely. we bought you a pink tie in the Oxfam shop. Oh my God. Purple suit and pink tie. Please, Please give Andy a huge round of applause.